Hello, my name is Kent Philpott, and this is the Bible study, the book of Acts. We're in program number 50. Uh, we're looking at a passage in Acts chapter 16 called The Philippian Jailer Converted. Now, uh, there'd been a problem in the Roman colony of Philippi in Macedonia. If you have a map, you can look it up. It's always good to get an idea of uh, where uh, these things take place. Uh, it's about the year 51, 52 AD. Uh, this is in the process of the second missionary journey of Paul. Uh, Silas is there, uh, Timothy some of the time, and uh, Luke himself. So that uh, who Luke is, by the way, the writer of the book of Acts. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. And uh, so he has continued um, with uh, the book of Acts. It's kind of like volume number two. So uh, it's, uh, there was a big problem. There was a slave girl controlled by some wealthy, powerful men probably, and they were taking advantage of her. Uh, she was indwelt by a demonic spirit. They probably wouldn't have recognized it as a demonic spirit because such was fairly common in that day. The oracles like at Delphi, the Pythonic spirits, the ventriloquists, uh, the demons speaking out of a person, not the real person's talking. They knew that. That's where the word ventriloquist comes from. And, uh, and so she was able to tell fortunes, and they do so today. Uh, very convincing. Someone will tell you of what happened to you in your past that only you could know about. And when they reveal that they know that, you're, you're hooked. Because now you think, this person has got some spiritual power. Where they get it, I don't know. But it sure is real. You just don't realize that it is of a demonic origin. The devil and his demonic spirits can do that. Now, if you think, well, Phil Pot, you've just discredited yourself with that crazy, lunatic kind of talk. Uh, wish that it were so. Wish that all of that sort of thing were just, well, misdiagnosis, some kind of psychiatric situation where you encounter that sort of thing, or maybe there are aliens, or uh, maybe uh, they're tapped into some benevolent kind of spirituality that gives them this insight. Well, probably not, uh, but there is a demonic power that knows how to do that, and it's been ubiquitous throughout the history of humankind. It, it goes on today. I've seen plenty of it, more so than probably I'd like to. But it's all very genuine and real. And uh, by my word, you're not going to be able to make much headway in that. But at least open, be open to be skeptical and not downright denying it. Um, I would rather be able to deny it with authority than accept it. But... It's very real, have to face the facts. So here they are. Paul and Silas have been severely beaten. Um, uh, they are um, uh, in, in an inner jail, a, a maximum security place. Bad situation. They're in awful shape. They've been beaten, and the word in Greek is skinned. Uh, in other words, they flayed the skin off of them. It must have been terrible pain. And so here they are. We're going to begin reading now in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. It says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and sing, singing hymns to God. Now, I have had a hard time visualizing this. What do you mean praying and singing hymns after this terrible beating and so on? Um, is it a, of a miraculous nation, nature? Had they recovered to a degree? Had somebody helped them with their wounds? Uh, it's hard to know. Probably not, though. But they were praying, and apparently they were praying out loud. You know, Christians have all different kinds of ways of praying, and uh, mostly spontaneous. Some wrote prayers. We do both at Miller Avenue Church. And uh, they were singing hymns. It's, a hymn is a song. It's a Latin, I think comes from the Latin, it just means a song. That's all. They were singing songs. I'd love to have heard them. What were they singing? Wish we could have tape recorded it. That would have been fantastic. Uh, 
can you imagine to have heard that, how, what they were like? I, I have a feeling, because both Paul and Silas were Jewish, they were probably singing the Psalms. Maybe they had invented some of their, the, the wording of, of uh, put it to some tunes, that wording that had a Christian content now, um, and maybe they were singing some of the passages from uh, prophets talking about the coming of the Messiah, like in Isaiah 53, putting that to words, and to a tune, we don't know. But it says, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, sometimes I thought, well, they were preaching. It was a way of preaching to these people. I think not. Uh, that was a secondary consequence. But I think for some reason, they had a kind of joy that was going on. And I, I want to read something to you in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, and some verses here, uh, but I would like us to see this in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 9, uh, what, uh, uh, what a great thing that these guys experience, and it's, uh, it is for Christians today. Listen to this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A lot of people think Christianity is, okay, you join a church, you go and give your money, you get baptized, you take communion, and you try to be a good person and help the poor. That's what most people think Christianity is. Now, all those things are okay, but they are largely meaningless in the greater sense of what it means to become saved, what salvation is. It's something, notice he says, caused us to be born again to a living hope. Uh, so many people, we're ho hopeless today. We look around us and we're, we're hopeless. Well, Jesus is the living hope. He says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. One of the doctrines of Christianity is once born again, you can't be unborn again, even if you're a complete rascal like I have been. Uh, if rascals could lose their salvation, I would have lost mine for sure. Um, and those people who know me, they'll say, that Phil Potty was no good. And you know what? They're right. They're exactly right. But you can't lose it. I, I can't stop becoming a human being. I'm a human being. I've been born a human being. I'm not going to stop being a, born a, being a human being until I'm dead. This is who I am. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. You have, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That explains what Paul and Silas were doing. That's why I've read this. How could this happen? That's how it happens. Now, just a little more. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, the Christian will experience joy. It is that inner thing of knowing that however bad you've been, all your sin has been absolutely washed away, forgiven, forgotten by God, separated, biblically speaking, as far as the east is from the west, and that your entire eternity is totally and completely secure. That not make you happy, that makes you joyous. Happy is dependent on so many things. Happy is not the goal. Joy is the goal. Happiness comes and goes. Joy remains through the most difficult of times. And that's what we have in Christ. Uh, I can tell you that because I've been through hell more than once. 
about three times. Not been fun. That's not been an easy ride for a guy like Philpot. And, uh, <clears throat> but I have the joy. I've had the joy. It didn't go away. You had troubled times. You know, uh, the great psychiatrist and uh, neurologist by the name of Frank, uh, Victor Frankl, who survived three years in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, what he observed there in that period of time that people survived with three things. First of all, they had to have a loving relationship. And we have that in Christ. We have it with us, a personal relationship with God and with brothers and sisters in Christ. Secondly, have meaning. Many people have no meaning today. They don't know what they're here for. They try different things. It fails, succeeds. Even when it succeeds, it doesn't give it for, it doesn't work. So you have a love relationship. You have meaning and purpose. The third is you understand that suffering is unavoidable. Suffering is unavoidable. And with those three things, it makes a whole difference in how you go about living your life. And so the Christian has it with the joy that we have in Christ that can't be taken from us, that we can't even lose no matter how bad we are, but it is in that very knowing that we are called to follow Jesus closely. Some people will say, well, you Christians, you're, you're going you're gonna to go to heaven. You've got salvation whipped, so it doesn't make any difference what you do. Well, that's a complete distortion, misunderstanding, and not at all biblical. You know, it's what draws us to be careful followers of Jesus as best we can. Well, I better get with this passage. So, so they were listening. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. Well, was that <coughs> earthquake a miracle? or natural occurrence. Could be either, doesn't Paul, you know, notice Luke does not say, we don't have Paul, when he talks about these sort of things, he never mentions that such a thing was a miraculous event or a natural event, he, you just suspect that it was. Um, that's where I would go anyway. So if the foundations were shaken, immediately all the doors were open and everybody's bonds were unfastened, see, an earthquake may cause a lot of trouble, but all of a sudden, the things that held it to the wall, they broke it. Well, that sounds like a miracle to me and not the result of an earthquake. Anyway, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew a sword and was about to kill himself, <coughs> supposing that the prisoners had escaped. <coughs> I was going to bring my little Gladys. Gladys is a two-foot Roman sword, fairly broad, steel. And what they would do, I was going to demonstrate for you, they'd hold it here, put the tip up to the neck, and they thrust it up and they kill themselves just in seconds. Because in the inner prison, someone escaped. They all knew that someone escaped, the jailer died. And... <clears throat> That's what was, that was what is at stake here. So he drew a sword and was about to kill himself. He didn't want to go through the shame, the pain, all the mess that would have had to go through. <clears throat> it would have had to go through for both himself and his family. But Paul cried with a loud voice. In the Greek, it's a big voice. Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Now, people have get, wondered, how was it that Paul knew that? Um, one of the commentators I read thought that maybe as the jailer opened a door uh, into the inner sanctum that would enter prison, uh, that he stood there and Paul was able to see silhouetted the jailer in front of the, the light that was coming from behind him uh, from the open door. Well, we don't know, but that's a pretty good guess. Somehow, Paul was able to see what was taking place, and that was no miracle, not intended to be a miraculous kind of an event here at all. And uh, he said, do not harm yourself. We are all here. Paul was concerned that that man did not harm himself at all. <clears throat> Verse 29, and the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Now, the lights, they would have had to have been Maybe candles, maybe torches, probably torches. 
I remember seeing Ben Hur, uh, what was a story in and around this time a little bit earlier, but not far distant. And uh, we had torches then, and I had understood it was supposed to have been a pretty accurate, historically um, filmed uh, piece. But the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Now, <coughs> you know, <coughs> we wish many times that Luke would be a little clearer, give us a little more detail. Uh, if they had done that, Acts would have been uh, as long as the whole New Testament itself. Uh, he's brief. He, he dispenses with a lot of connectors. He doesn't always put the dots together. And, and here's another case. Because we're not sure what kind of fear was causing him to tremble. He was trembling with fear, but fear of what? Uh, <clears throat> fear of being uh, killed by the Romans? Well, probably not because they were all still there. By this time, other troops had come in, other soldiers. Roman soldiers. Nobody's getting out. If, if they were going to do that, they would have had to do, had done that earlier. Uh, and too late now, they're surrounded, very likely surrounded, with guys with swords and spears. So that's not going to happen. So what was he trembling with fear about? Uh, the surmise is that this Philippian jailer heard what was being sung, and what was being prayed. We don't know, <clears throat> because Luke doesn't tell us. So we have to kind of guess. We use our best. It's kind of fun to be a Bible preacher and teacher, because uh, you get to intensely study passages. It's like almost anything else. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing that was close to it was when I was going to law school. And you would have to read briefs so very carefully because you're going to have to explain them uh, <clears throat> coming up. And uh, you had to know every detail. And so it was a great experience for me to do that. Now, I always cherished my law school days because it, it forced me into carefully analyzing every word, every phrase, every sentence. And <clears throat> I then applied it. And this was many, several decades ago. I applied it to my Bible preaching and teaching. And I do the same thing I used to do then. I go deeply as far as I can, and I look at the sources. I look up everything I can. I look at the language. It's one of the reasons I had to learn the language. That's why they teach Greek and Hebrew in seminary. Because the English isn't good enough. You've got to go into the original languages. And you've got to read the guys that, you know, with back, your centuries of backgrounds into understanding the text. And you have to absorb this. And you got your books. And you got to do it. And it's, it used to be sort of a task to me. Now I love to do it. I can hardly wait on Monday to start working on my sermons. I usually start Sunday afternoons. I love to get into the text, get into the scripture, see what it says. Start thinking about it. And it's a great thing to do. But still... Sometimes we don't get it. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Now here's the crew, verse 30. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs. Notice a respectful title. They're, <laughs> they've been beaten half to death. They're probably still bleeding, oozing pus and blood. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Saved. It's... A verb, of course. Aorist means a sudden, not a process that goes on into some kind of future. Start me on the road so I learn. Not that. Aorist and the passive, um, the passive voice, you know, there's active, middle, and passive. Active, I do it. Middle emphasizes you yourself did it. The passive, it happens to you. The subject is acted upon. Here, he wants to know how he can be acted upon, what can happen, so that he can be saved. Now, 
you know, life is important. Growing up, getting educated, getting work, maybe having a family, accomplishing some things, some goals, having your own home, so on and so forth. These things are good. Achieving some kind of status, that's all good. But it's all fleeting. It's all fleeting. It comes and it goes. And even if it all gets there, and you've enjoyed the best of all things, let me tell you, you're still going to drop dead. We're not, none of us are going to get out of this alive. And sometimes that becomes very apparent to us as the Holy Spirit reveals the reality, our reality to us. That I don't care how healthy I am and I'm doing my yoga and I'm working out of the gym and I watch my food, I'm eating no garbage stuff, all the stuff I see on television and the ads, I follow everything. And I'm doing everything to be happy and enjoy my life and have meaning. It's not working. <clears throat> One issue is saved because there is a heaven and there is a hell. Now, you know, people don't like Christians to be talking about hell. A lot of Christians don't like other Christians like me <coughs> talking about hell, but I have to because it's a reality. I, it would be a disservice to those who hear me to intimate that it's all doesn't really count. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is, God is a holy God and no sin can come before him. And unless we're washing the blood of Jesus... We have sin on us, and that's just a reality. And in Christ, only in Christ can that be removed and be made holy. Not that we're perfect, but in God's eyes, you become holy. You're placed into the body of Christ. It's a mystery. I don't understand it either. <clears throat> Verse 31, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved and your household. Now, they've been praying and singing hymns. I have an idea. They were very Christ-centered hymns. This jailer had heard the message of the gospel in the hymns. If the hymn doesn't have the message of the gospel in it, it needs to be rewritten. Believe. That means trust in. Believe means to trust, rely upon. Not yourself then, not in what you can do or what you believe or what you think or what you can accomplish. No, that's all nice. It's all nice. But that's not going to get you anywhere. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Lord, the idea is Master, Messiah, King, Ruler, God in the flesh. That's what Lord means. Kurios in the Greek. Trust in the Lord Jesus. And you will be saved. Notice the will be. The be, the passive against. You will be if you trust. But... Don't worry, you can't believe. You can't do it. I can't do it. If I say, okay, I believe God's real, that's, okay, that's good. But belief is a gift. Belief is something you get. People say, I try to believe. I want to believe. How can I believe? People will say this to me. I hear it from time to time. I want to believe. I can't believe it. it you're not going to be able to. You have to ask God for it. It's a gift. It's asking God for the gift of faith in Jesus. As the scripture says, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And your household, your household. Here again, like Lydia, notice these stories are back to back like Lydia, the household. Everybody's going to get baptized. And again, people think, well, that, see, you're supposed to baptize the children. Well, it's okay to baptize children. Just to let them think that as they grow up that, that that sprinkling or that pouring or whatever is the instrument, the magical wand of salvation. If you have that happen, <clears throat> that means you're saved. No, that's not it. There's no way to surmise that there were children in this household. Very likely not. The jailer was probably a retired army a Roman soldier and living there with some servants. Uh, but the idea, <clears throat> other than that, is a surmise only, as F.F. F. Bruce would say. Verse 32, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. They spoke the word of the Lord. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once. How important baptism is. Real Christians, born-again Christians, will get baptized. You, real Christian, haven't been baptized, get a hold of me. Uh, you'll see my email in a minute, my phone number, I think. Give me a call. We'll do it. 
and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. <coughs> and he rejoiced, along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. Ha, ah, what a great saying. He believed with all his family. I got a long paragraph to read. Here we go. But when it was day, the magistrates sent their police saying, <coughs> let those men go. Why? Luke doesn't tell us. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go, therefore come out now and go in peace. Well, Paul's not going to do that. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, that's the word skinned, and uncondemned men who are Roman citizens. Sius cum Romanus. I am a Roman citizen. Men who are Roman citizens, you couldn't do that without a trial. And have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, he says. Paul was a tough guy. He said, no. You don't think, oh, man, we're out of jail. Let's go. Paul said, no, we're not going to do that. Let them come themselves and take us out. Because, see, these were the, in the, in the Roman colony of Philippi, <clears throat> it was important for the fledgling church for all of the people that were going to become followers of Jesus. And the church in Philippi was just starting, became a very important church. And if they had just snuck out of town, it wouldn't have been good. It would cast a pale over, a dark pale over the early Christians. Because here was Paul and Silas, the ones who brought them the message of Jesus, and they weren't going to let this just happen. They wanted vindication and authentication. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. To be a Roman citizen was a big deal, much more than to be an American citizen today. You are a Roman citizen, <coughs> that was huge. I want to see if I got the Roman quote right, the Latin quote, if I can find it. <coughs> yeah, quis o quis Romanus sum. Sum, I am a uh, Roman citizen. Romanus Sius, uh, citizen. I am a Roman citizen. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. And they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. Remember, here's Lydia, the first one converted in Philippi. They visited her, and when they had seen the brothers... They encouraged them and departed. By the way, I want to point out that brothers means brothers and sisters. It's a, it's a term we find that Luke uses, and it is inclusive. It's an inclusive term. It is not only referring to the male gender by any means. Okay, there you go. The story of the Philippian jailer. So long.